Welcome to App Center, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Brian Crane. Today, we're speaking with Ilya and Alex. They're the co-founders of Near Protocol. Uh, I met these guys a long time ago in San Francisco, and they were kind of starting out. And now, since then, Near has evolved into one of the leading smart contract ecosystems. They are, uh, you know, kind of have also been among the leaders around sharding and creating a sharded proof of stake blockchains. And, you know, it's become really vibrant, uh, vibrant ecosystem with like lots of people building on it. So super excited to, to dive into that. Now, before we go to that with Ilya and Alex, uh, just a few words about our sponsors. So first of all, we have Tally. So Tally is a new wallet for Web3 and DeFi, and that sees the wallet as a public good. So it's a bit like a community owned MetaMask alternative. It has all the features of MetaMask, but it's uh, fully open source. And it's 100% user owned. So uh, profits go into a community, not a corporation. So the launch of Tally is coming uh, this year, uh, but there's an early version, community edition that's out. And uh, you know, if you want to get involved, uh, go join the Discord or check it out at tally.cash. And our second sponsor is Gnosis Safe. So the Gnosis Safe is a smart wallet that enables you to control digital asset with much more granular permissions. So you can use multiple private keys, a subset of which uh, you know, to require for executing transactions. And then you can store the keys on different devices, hardware or software, uh, and even share them among multiple people. So it's basically Gnosis Safe has you know, best security and personalization and customization among kind of Web3 asset management uh, or wallets, and it's beca- so it's become uh, really massive as a solution for individual schemes and DAOs and storing over $100 billion worth of assets on there. And also, Gnosis Safe is now live on Aurora, which we can, uh, we can touch on in, in this episode, which is the EVM that's running on, on near networks. So even near users can uh, start using uh, the Gnosis Safe. So yeah, go uh, check out the Gnosis Safe. And with that, let's go to our episode. Uh, thanks so much for joining me today. It's, uh, it's great to finally have you on. This, is, this has been like for a long time, it's like we've got to do a near episode. We have to do a near episode. So like I'm, I'm, I'm happy it's finally happening. Yeah, thanks, Brian, for inviting us. Excited to be here. Okay, so let's let's start a little bit at the beginning. Tell us, like, how did you end up deciding to start uh, building near and build a you know layer one smart contract platform? Our origin story starts with us actually working on AI, um, hence near AI, uh, the idea that uh, AI is near and singularity is coming, which is a separate topic. We should probably have another episode on, but. We were working on kind of teaching machines to program. And to do that, we actually worked with a lot of people around the world to collect data. And kind of the data we needed was pretty specific. We wanted people to describe code, to write code for problems we had, which means we needed kind of a wide ra- like wide cast of people across the world who are able to do that. And mostly it was students of universities uh, kind of in places like China, Russia, Ukraine, um, and, and kind of other countries. And we, being a US company, just had trouble paying them. Like sending money to all those countries is has some problem. Plus not all the students actually have a bank account, uh, or at least a bank account that can receive uh, foreign transfers. And uh, we started looking at blockchain as a kind of solution to the problem we had ourselves, right? And kind of as we dive in, it obviously evolved into, well, how do we build a kind of crowdsourcing as a service platform on blockchain? And then kind of diving in, realizing the limitations of the kind of blockchain technologies, right? Um, at that point, you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum obviously were the two main ones. There are a few others who already launched uh, but none of them would they be able to handle kind of microtransactions and um, like le- level of usage that we would expect, right? At the cost, which is reasonable if you're paying 
15 like, cents. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. were paying like, well, not 15 cents, but a couple bucks per person. So you need transaction fees which are adequate for the use case. So, so back then it was it was not possible, right? So crypto was unusable for the use case, and and, and here we see well this is a problem. Uh, that's a problem we have. So if we have it, some someone else probably does does as well, right? Uh, and then. Are we uniquely positioned to solve it? We are pretty well positioned to solve it, right? I was building databases before. Ilya was working on TensorFlow, which is also pretty low level uh, stuff. Uh, and we happen to have plenty of people around us who were also with the databases background or uh, systems background who were in between things, right? So they either just left their, their work, their job at Google or also in MySQL where I'm from or Facebook to look for something fun and cool. Or they were still working somewhere, but they were extremely unhappy, constantly sharing this unhappiness with us. So, so we were able to very quickly identify in our internal network how many, like six other people, yeah. around six people, yeah, who were immediately available to join. So we, we grew from three people building AI uh, to, to nine. nine people building a blockchain on a night from Sunday to Monday. Uh, and so that, that's how Nier started. I think you guys were part of Y Combinator as well. So was that with the the AI, basically near AI, and then it evolved into this blockchain or? Near is not a YC company. YC company was a different one. So, so I started a company with another person. Uh, it, was, it was in reverse. We started a company for the sake of starting company. And then we're like, we'll figure out what to build. Uh, that's like exact opposite of the textbook approach. Uh, and as we were building it, we went to YC. That's when we met Ilya. So Ilya joined us while we were in YC. And then at the end of the YC, there was a certain founder. Uh, we did not quite agree on the future direction, right? So Ilya and I, we separated and reincorporated into Nier. Uh, so Ilya and I wanted to build program synthesis. Uh, the third co-founder did not like the idea of program synthesis. So Nier is not a YC company, uh, uh, but we all met sort of during that time, well, me and Ilya. And uh, you you guys have been through like a long journey together. How has it been to to work with each other as co-founders? It's a healthy relationship. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean it, it's you know it's a, it's a it's a journey of ups and downs. Like any startup is a journey of ups and downs, but it, it's good yeah. to have kind of a partner who you can you know work with and share with and and know that you're able to kind of continuously push through any challenges. Yes, yes, we've been we've been through more downs than I've, I've been in my marriage <laughs> in years. So. <laughs> I remember actually when I was speaking with you guys in uh, maybe it was 2018 or 2019, but you know, at the time there was already this like Eve 2 roadmap and you know, this idea of this like sharded Eve 2. And I remember, I think even when we were speaking with you guys, you, you were basically saying, like, look, this is kind of like pretty much the same as Eve 2, you know, in terms of like the architecture, but, you know, we're just going to be better at executing it. And like, uh, you know, we're going to do a better job of building it. I'm now, I, I think now since then, a lot has changed, right? Like, I think Neo has probably developed a lot. Also, Ethereum has, you know, gone through many. Uh, you know, many iterations in their uh, philosophy. I'm, I'm wondering, like, how has, how has, like, the near vision and the near idea, like, changed since the start? I, will, I would say, actually, so kind of when, when, you know, when we started, there were, like, one thing that was clear, right, is that, you know, if, if you want people to use the, the blockchain technology, which, you know, we wanted to, you need to make it kind of dirt cheap, which also like naturally means it should be scalable and ability to accept any user that comes to it. <clears throat> and, and the only way to do that, right, is sharding. And to be clear, at that point, we did not know about these two. Um, we had, quickly learned about it. We quickly yeah. learned, but yeah, like at, when we started, we were like, hey, sharding is needed. We looked at all the stuff at the, like, we looked at Definity, we looked at kind of EOS and like all of the, you know, IOTA, all of the folks who were at that point uh, kind of, Super hyped. Definitely was not sharded yet. Th that was later. Yeah, and and so we're like none of them are actually solving or or planning to solve the like in the roadmap planning to solve the problems we're seeing in the way we see fit, right? And then we did go to like East San Francisco, I think, and learned more about it too. Uh, well, that there are different sharding designs in in the existence. One mm -hmm. of them, Alex, ended up implementing at East San Francisco. 
<laughs> but uh, yeah, I think the kind of the realization was also pretty quickly is that beyond just sharding, beyond just kind of just scaling capability, it's about usability, right? And actually scalability becomes just a piece of it because as a user, I should not need to worry about that some crypto kitties are running wild or, you know, somebody runs some trading bots and kind of willing to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on fees. Like I just want to use the stuff and have a predictable um, experience. And on the flip side, as a developer, I also just want to sit down and, you know, write some code, ship it and get users really quickly. So, so I think kind of the way we now frame this is that, you know, the experience should be simple, secure and scalable, right? The blockchain should be as hidden as possible while delivering on the promise. The security should be there, right, to, you know, provide your economic security as well as actually fit back into the user space, you know, things like, you know, is this contract may rag pull you, you know, how to make sure that if seed phrases are accidentally leaked, that this transaction will not pass, like all the security system that should be built kind of in middleware. And then, and like we built some tools on the back end in a protocol to enable that. And then the scalability is, yes, it should, you know, scale to billions of users. Otherwise, like this technology is not going to get adopted, right? And uh, we're going to end up in a Black Mirror episode. I also wanted to touch a little on what you mentioned about uh, us believing in the past that we can execute better than Ethereum, right? So, so when we were talking three years ago, like we, we didn't know anything, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, needed, we needed some something <laughs> to say. But uh, yeah, so what happened was that we started designing sharding. And if you, when you start thinking, like if you, if you read the papers from all, all the sharded blockchains, like the early papers, the first papers they've had, they're all very similar. Because when, once you start thinking, there's a particular direction you take. And so we all took that direction. We all like diverged a little bit, right? So Ethereum and us and Polkadot, we all believed in a slightly higher level of security where you don't trust, uh, like small validator sets, which are sampled from a big set, like some other chains did trust, et cetera. But there wasn't much differ differentiation at the beginning. But then what, were, what, what was on our side was that we were, uh, we were a group of people in a single room, right, with a whiteboard. While Ethereum was significantly more uh, widespread decentralized uh, uh, system, and because of that, we were able to quickly iterate and see what doesn't work. So what happened was that very early on, we realized that that design that everybody comes up with is uh, unusable. It's it's unusable. It's super complex. Like it will take a, a very long time to build it. The the interaction uh, with with the system will be pretty uh, suboptimal. And so what happened was that early on, we just went ahead and deleted the entire code base we've built in the first seven months. Uh, we just purged it and we started over with a significantly simpler design called Nightshade. Uh, and, uh, and eventually what happened was that uh, Ethereum also realized that like the original design is too complex, but it, it took them significantly longer because they, they didn't have this insight, which we got very early by building it, uh, by starting building it, right? So, uh, so the time was on our side because of this because of us being in the same room with the whiteboard uh, and moving quickly. Yeah, and I think maybe maybe diving in into Nightshade, kind of how it compares, right? The, the basic idea is that instead of sharding blockchains, right, and having lots of blockchain running in parallel uh, and having all the problems of communication between them and keeping track of them, uh, which is, you know, some, some of the chains who went this way are uh, kind of continuously need to solve for, uh, we actually sharding blocks. And so it was in, in a way like, you know, there's this meme of big blocks. And so like, yes, at some point you cannot, you know, increase the size of block because then between like executing it and transporting it, um, it will take significant time. And so we actually splitting block into so-called chunks into that we, that are processed in parallel, that are kind of collected in parallel. And that allows us to have kind of still one single chain, right? From a user perspective, from developer perspective, it's one blockchain. Uh, they don't need to know about kind of underlying sharding design layout or anything. And they are able to kind of communicate with blockchain as if, as if it's a single entity, but we can actually parallelize processing, parallelize storage, parallelize kind of block collection and, and network. propagation network, yeah. So all of the pieces that are bottlenecks right now in blockchains are now parallelized and, uh, and 
the most interesting thing, which is still in our future roadmap, is ability to dynamically kind of reallocate, uh, kind of increase number of the shards, right? And so this way we can actually dynamically grow block size um, and, and state size uh, based on the usage of the blockchain, right? As kind of more users come in, we actually can increase capacity, which, which is a kind of precondition for the blockchains to be able to handle, you know, lots of users is ability to dynamically scale up, right? Like you, no, you never hear from Facebook is like, oh, when you log in, it's like, wait, wait, guys, you know, there's already hunt, like, you know, 10 million users, you need to wait for it for a few minutes. It's like, no, they actually just build more data centers underneath. And so kind of the eventual goal is to be able to do that in, you know, permissionless setting. That's great. Like, I'm really uh, excited to kind of dive into this. Like w one thing that kind of, it reminds me of when you're saying, okay, like this, uh, sh splitting the blocks into chunks and, you know, processing in parallel, right? In Solana, they, right, they basically do something a little bit similar, right? Where they're basically saying like, okay, you know, what are the transactions that like don't touch each other in terms of state? And then they're using these GPUs to also like execute them in parallel. Now they don't have, it's still on like a single, uh, you know, single validator, single machine. It, it, you have to do something similar here, right? Because I guess you obviously can't have uh, transactional contracts that, you know, affect each other in a single block, you know, split across different validators. So like, how do you deal with the kind of interactions between different uh, programs and transactions? So Solana parallelizes processing, right? So that allows you to utilize, well, multiple cores or like in the future, they, they're talking about GPUs. There's no GPUs today, I guess. Uh, it also allows them to, to use uh, the, uh, the fact that uh, SSDs today is, are very good at processing parallel requests, so you can read and write in parallel. But they do not take advantage of, uh, like they don't parallelize network, right? right? Every validator still needs to receive the full block with all the transactions. Not only every validator, but also every node that is watching the network. So that's a, that's a slightly bigger problem. So it is. It is maybe reasonable to require validators to run very expensive hardware, right? right? Like, like, let's put this question aside. But it's uh, uh, building a system like that also requires every node in the system to run on expensive hardware, right? So that is actually damaging in the sense that it, it costs a lot of money if you just want to ensure that the network is operating correctly, right? So in sharded system, what you do is uh, you first split the state. So the state, the entire state is split into multiple shards. Uh, and then as a node, you choose which shards you want to. So, so if you're not validating node, you choose which shards you track, right? And so, uh, with a very cheap hardware, you can go and validate a single shard, right? But but as a community, like if the community has ten thousand nodes, and like, like assuming that people choose which shards to validate somewhat evenly, you have the entire network being validated by a very large number of people with cheap hardware, right? Validators are assigned shards. So if you're a validator, you're you're told which shard you're validating. Right, and then you only you only have to then load state uh, and transactions and chunks only for that shard. So it significantly reduces first of all your requirements for the disk storage. Right, the state explodes in blockchains today, uh, but you only need to store one shard worth of state, which is its full state divided by number of shards. It's significantly smaller, uh, and the network requirement is also smaller because you only need to then load transactions which are touching your state. That introduces its own challenges. Specifically, transactions do not like to only touch state of a single shard. It happens that transactions often do touch state of multiple shards. Like e even a transaction as simple as me sending money to Ilya, if we do happen to reside in different shards, it is a cross-shard transaction, right? So it introduces this challenge. That on itself is a pretty interesting problem. We can talk about it separately, right? So it needs to be solved. But, but, but in comparison with the sort of monolith blockchains, which are, uh, which are paralyzing processing, uh, they, they're solving for one bottleneck, which is storage. So CPU is not a bottleneck. CPU is not a bottleneck for any blockchain today, but they are solving storage as a bottleneck, but not network. Uh, and and not and when I mean storage, I mean like IO IO speed. So so there are three bottlenecks. One is IO speed. One is how much storage you can actually fit on a single machine, right? Like the state of the blockchain grows. And the third one is network. So by by parallelizing processing, you are solving for uh, for IO for IO speed, but you're not solving for network, and you're not solving for the for the size of the state that you need to store. So would it be then, okay, let's say there's something like a Uniswap or some DEX, and then that's on like, you know, a particular shard, 
And if I'm, I, for example, I want to run a, run a node, I want to know uh, what's going on on that DEX, then I just run the node for that shard. And then... Yeah. Moreover, there's a particular feature which allows you to say, hey, I care about this account, and that will automatically track whichever shard that the account resides on. Right, so it's, it's even made very simple for you to have a node which tracks a particular set of accounts. Yeah, let, let's talk about the... I mean, is there some kind of cross-shard, uh, like how do cross-shard interactions work? So yeah, this is where the cost for the scalability comes from, right? Uh, you, there's no free lunch. And so the cost is that pretty much logically, every single contract on Near is actually lives in its own logical shard. So they all live kind of in parallel. And if you want to communicate between any of the contracts, the model is not kind of what Ethereum and any other monolith blockchains are using, but actually a sending message and receiving messages. That's a kind of the communication protocol. And so this is actually way more similar to kind of services like microservices architecture that exists in, uh, you know, in regular fintech and in, in web, where each service kind of lives independently, has some piece of state associated to it, and they communicate with each other through, uh, through messages. And then the kind of the protocol underneath kind of groups this logical shards, right, logic like smart contracts into a physical shard and an actual shard. And, and facilitates the communication, right? So when one contract, for example, my account uh, sends money to Uniswap, right? I create a message saying, you know, send like N near, for example, to this other Uniswap contract, that protocol, you know, sees this message, routes it to the right shard, that shard receives it as in like just a message that coming in, similar to any other in a way transaction, just as some metadata attached, process that for the Uniswap contract and then routes it, for example, if there is some uh, outgoing funds, for example, going to another account uh, to the next thing. And so this, in a way, um, like adds, I would say, some complexity compared to, for example, Ethereum model, where everything is synchronous and you kind of, when you're calling another contract, you'll get back the result within the same transaction and if anything fails, the whole thing kind of rolls back. Uh, here, you do kind of, you, if something failed in Uniswap, then you will get a callback saying that that failed, but then you need to handle kind of what's, a, uh, what's that kind of result or, or um, failure need to be, like the way it needs to be handled for your specific contract. And uh, it takes a little bit of time, right? Because it, the messaging is communicating between chunks, uh, between chunks produced, and so it may take like one or two seconds if this is a uh, complex multi multi uh, contract uh, transaction. But in result, you know that's why we have like one second blocks, which are you know propagate really quickly and allow us to route these messages really really quickly and. Uh, there is also interesting things like Aurora, which comes in to offset some of this as well. So, so then this is the case like between any kind of uh, smart contract interactions that you basically don't have this, you know, that you have this. Uh, I, I guess it reminds me a little bit of uh, sort of the the Cosmos IBC model. In a way, yeah. I mean. It, it, it is, that's what I'm saying, like in a way, logically you can think that every contract on Near is its own chain. Right. It's its own Cosmos zone. Yeah, it's yeah. Its almost all, all, its own Cosmos zone and we just have a really, you know, fast IBC that is under the same security assumptions. And, that, and that's the main thing is actually security assumptions are exactly the same. And so as a contract developer, as a user, you don't need to think about like, oh, is that zone going to blow up? Is this messages are coming, right? Like users don't need to think about that at all and developers either, like they think of it as a monolith system that kind of runs all the services uh, and, and communication between them. But underneath, you know, because of this, we can actually rearrange where the contracts live physically, right? We can actually move them between shards dynamically. And that's kind of like what's always been on our roadmap. It, we can, you know, if for example, one of the contracts becomes really popular, we can actually move it out into its own shard 
And now it has way more capacity, right? It has full capacity of the full shard, uh, which is, you know, as much as one computer can process. And importantly, if you, if you were on the same shard, you're not affected anymore when it's moved out. So, so you don't suffer because uh, someone deployed something very popular, yeah. which happened to be on the same shard as you. And, and by not suffer, meaning like as well, the networking is not broken. Because right now, what we've seen so far, right, is every time some contract becomes popular, it's not even that the like you know processing gets. I mean, obviously things get expensive if there's a, a price auction, but the network gets flooded with the messages because like somebody runs bots or whatever. And so again, the point is like you isolate it into separate networking, and so all the other processing continues kind of as it is. And so Aurora is a great example because it actually runs on a separate shard because it is a popular contract on Near. You know, we can dive in like what does that actually mean, but kind of we already have this in a more, I would say, governance way where we can allocate kind of uh, contracts and shards and split uh, the state more like through governance versus dynamically. But over time, the idea is to kind of have that, you know, reallocation dynamics similar how AWS, you know, can scale your uh, like database or scale your uh, websites with load balancing type of thing. Okay, that's very, very interesting, very cool. Yeah, I guess it also sort of like illustrates, I think what you guys are saying is no, like we use this term like sharding in, in blockchain and I get, I get this is, seems to be a lot of differences in how that's actually understood and how it's implemented. Well, to, to be clear, it's the same in, in regular, you know, systems programming. Yeah. Like there, there's a concept of sharding, which means like process stuff in parallel. And then how exactly you implement really depends on specific architecture of a database or, or the, you know, services you're building. So yeah, Cassandra, VoltDB and single store are all sharded, but there's no similarities in their architectures. So yeah, let, let's talk about it. Maybe a bit sort of like the, the state of it. Right now, I think my understanding is there's f four shards. Is that correct? Yeah, there's four shards right now um, with one dedicated for Aurora. Okay, so our, maybe let's start with Aurora. So Aurora is basically like an EVM, uh, EVM shard, right? Exactly, yeah. So, so this was kind of um, stepping back, right? We mentioned the developer experience, right? And so we were kind of optimizing for how do we make it really simple to build um, applications on Near. And that means, you know, using something that people are familiar with that is... People the, outside <clears throat> of crypto. Yeah, people outside of crypto. And, and, and things that you can pull in existing code. That, that was also an important piece because like if I'm built, like, you know, most of the development usually is just pulling in, you know, five libraries and then stringing them together. And so we chose to use WebAssembly because of this, because it give, gave us kind of the, this platform that there's a lot, that a huge community of people for building compilers and kind of instrumentation and tooling for, right? WebAssembly runs in every single browser Probably while we're recording this, somewhere, you know, WebAssembly actually runs to render some of the graphics. And so that gave us kind of the fun, fun, fundamental pieces. Um, and then this was kind of obviously a detour from how a lot of developers in crypto kind of uh, back then were thinking because they were all building a Solidity for EVM. And kind of as an idea, we always. Uh, wanted to see how we can bring, you know, the existing code and existing uh, products to, to near. And so at some point there was a prototype where we just took part of open Ethereum, right? Part, part of the client, uh, of parity client back then and ran it, like compiled it to WebAssembly and ran it, right? Again, because the whole point was that we can take existing code and just execute it. And so we actually got the VM to run as a smart contract on near. And so that's on its own is super powerful, right? Like it means you can run, you know, potentially a pretty complex piece of software. Yeah, you, can, you can run Postgres yeah, as can, a smart contract. You can run Postgres as a smart contract potentially on near. And not that you should, but, <laughs> but, but you could, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but uh, and there will be one interesting thing coming in, in, in uh, like that we are able to run, which enables a lot of new use cases, but I'll not spoil it. But with EVM, what happened is it became clear that 
we can actually build a environment, right? Uh, think of it as a, we call them containers now, uh, where all the AVM contracts can live in one kind of near smart contract, con yeah, near smart contract, near container. And they inside can be synchronous because they actually will live on the same shard and communicate with each other and have you know state uh, available to them. And so that kind of kicked off this idea of Aurora, which is, well, actually, we can offer this as kind of isolated container that people can just go directly deploy, build their apps, and you know create a very compatible environment to existing experiences, both for developers and users. Which is also completely <clears throat> transparent to them. So like, as Aurora user, you don't need to understand any of that. For all you care, there's an EVM contract on Near, and your MetaMask gladly connects to it, and all the tooling works. Right, so underneath, it's, a, it's just a smart contract compiled into Wasm, which runs all the EVM smart contracts. But, but users, users don't need to know about it. For users, Near is just a uh, fully functional EVM chain, which is interoperable with all the non-EVM contracts that Near has. Yeah. And so this concept, by the way, can be extended, right? You can have you know, a single container with other languages and other frameworks. Including Wasm. Including <laughs> Wasm itself, yeah. So you can actually create a Wasm smart contract that are synchronous with each other and call it, like, can call each other synchronously on one of the shards, right? And so um, in a way, this is actually, back, back in the day, Ethereum research was published about execution environments. And this is kind of, I mean, uh, like similar to that idea, but actually like the specific implementation that also you know hooks in with all the tooling. Cool, uh, interesting. I mean, it also seems similar in some ways to sort of the Polkadot parachain model. I mean, to a lesser extent, because Polkadot and, and, and rollups on Ethereum, right, the way they operate is by having a separate operator that kind of collects transactions, does, you know, ordering execution state, kind of state maintenance, and then they use the beacon chain or Ethereum mainnet as a way to settle and secure the state, right? And so what this means is you need to run separate validators or, or operators, collators. collators, yeah. You need to run, uh, you know, now you are responsible for, um, like whoever runs that, responsible for censorship resistance, right, which like let's say in roll-up cases, there's like you know one operator usually, which there's so many ways this can go wrong, um, and then and then you have kind of this like checking in state of of your state. You need the you know beacon chain to accept it to validate it, you know, um, and so that on top of it creates a complexity because now you as, as a user and developer, you're like, oh, my application is on this part chain or in this rollup, my money are on this other rollup, and I need to first you know, transfer things to figure out like how to move, is, is, is it even movable? How long do I need to wait for the settlement? All those things like just adding lots of complexity. With Aurora, there's no complexity because literally it's a smart contract. You can think, you know, from a different side, it's, a, it's like a why earn you know, vault where you, know, you put money, for example, and it deploys it into some other things, and it's in the same, transaction, it's in the same network, right? There's no separate validators, there's no separate um, kind of security assumptions or anything. So wait, what if I want to run my own subtrade chain? What if it is my use case? You can. How do I do that? With near? Yeah. Well, we have Octopus Network for that. <laughs> I saw that, that I, this Octopus was like, this is, this is like interesting, no? Because it, it sounded like some Okay, using near and then substrate chains and then IBC. So it was like sort of. <laughs> <laughs> so the way the way being user friendly means is it's not you know Ilya or Alex or you know somebody on our team decided that this is the user friendly part. It's actually hearing what developers want and then making sure it's easy for them to do. And so Aurora is example of like I really don't think people should write in Solidity but people want to write Solidity, there's a lot of market for that. And so enabling them to do that on Near was, you know, part of the part of the thing. Similarly, and there are very specific cases when you do want to run separate chain because, um, you know, you need to customize how the communication happens or 
you need to customize like very deeply, you know, some kind of state uh, formation or, or zero knowledge integration or or you don't even want to show your state. You know, don't yeah. want to sh- show your state. You don't. You you maybe want to remove fees completely. Like, and you have a different way to do resi- resilience and 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 uh, spam de- uh, protection. And so all those re- like ways, right? Uh, again, enabling them to do that in an easy way, right? And so Octopus uh, built by by those folks in in kind of I mean globally, but uh, originally chi- team from China. Um, they kind of came up with this design where you can have a uh, kind of a smart contract on, on near mainnet, right, that facilitates all this and provides you leasing of the security uh, from near, right? So, and, and you can get pretty much validator, like collators who will run your chain when you, like, you check in your web assembly of your chain now, not a smart contract, and, and these validators will kind of get picked and, and start running it. Uh, and then there's obviously some sets of uh, you know security assumptions around that uh, to kind of facilitate it. But that'll like kind of octopus uh, main benefit that it's reasonably cheap to start this, and you can run you know tens of thousands of them because it's just as simple as kind of um, from perspective of doing it, right? It's as simple as just deploying a web, web assembly as well and kind of you know creating some token economics around. Uh, validators running it and it's substrate right and it's substrate yeah. yeah and i think they also want to extend it to cosmos sdk but yeah right now it's substrate yeah that's cool that's an interesting yeah so now maybe another question on the aurora thing so like now let's say we have aurora and then you know people writing smart contracts in there if they want to like interact or in some way with you know let's say other smart contracts as uh, are written in WebAssembly on like different shard how does that work? Do you need some kind of bridge for that, or like how how, how can they interoperate? Yeah, so so there is a one missing piece right now on the roadmap. So so to be clear, like a WebAssembly contract, uh, let's say you know some kind of AMM or whatever that wants to call into Aurora already does that, and there's actually examples of you know contracts on near that interact with contracts on uh, inside Aurora. And because for them, this is just a message, you know, through the regular API, just call Aurora contract with some arguments. And get the results. And get the yeah. results, yeah. And then get the call back pretty much uh, after it's finished. The way back, it requires adding a new precompile to EVM, to Aurora EVM, that allows the contracts to pretty much call back, like call out of the Aurora and receive the callbacks later. And so that part is on roadmap. Um, this hasn't been kind of yet you know, prioritized, but uh, but it's there, and it's it's not that complex to add that. And but right now, the folks who want to do this do it the other way. So if you, for example, want to call something uh, from EVM to uh, some other WebAssembly contract, you just you know you you do it the other way. You pull the data uh, from the EVM kind of in, uh, out. But moving assets works. Like yeah. if you need to move assets between Aurora and, and Near, that is. It is not even. It is not a bridge per se. Bridge usually assumes like bridging something with different levels of security, but but the, but Aurora just, is just yeah. is just Depo- a contract. It's yeah. depositing money into yes. Aurora contract. That's what really happens. Yeah. So it takes one second, and it uh, it only relies on the security of near, nothing else. So yeah, moving assets between Aurora and yeah. near. That's is what I'm saying. Like, seamless. Aurora is more of a like a vault that has you know different strategies in it, like mentally for people than a rollup because rollups assume different security. Some different uh, civil resistance and, and uh, censorship resistance, and here you have like a vault that is a smart contract that you can deposit and withdraw funds, and then inside it you can do different stuff with this uh, kind of like similarly we have actually Ref Finance for example our exchange as well where you can deposit funds and then you can trade uh, without withdrawing them like it's not it's not like Uniswap, you know, you move funds and then you get them back already on your account. Here actually deposit funds, trade, and then withdraw later. Uh, and so, like this kind of pattern is pretty popular on near because uh, it allows you to kind of move in everything, and then uh, transact with something that uh, doesn't require multiple kind of hops uh, across smart contracts. It, and then the other shards. So you know, we have Aurora shard. The other three shards are they? They're just uh, WebAssembly shards. Or? 
Well, they're all WebAssembly shards. It's yeah. more of a like it, it's it's a Aurora contract is pinned to one of the shards, and then the other ones are just uh, all the other things are split kind of evenly. Yeah, if you deploy a Wasm contract today, you will be assigned randomly to one of the shards, uh, and there is no benefit of being collocated with someone. So so there's no reason for you to grind and, and try to get on the shard with with someone else. You, you you're not getting any any benefit for that. Okay, so so that latency, if I if I like want to interact with the Dex and I, I end up being on the same shard, I still have the same kind of yeah, exactly. still yeah. still one one block latency yeah. for for the message yeah, which also has a lot of interesting like front run prevention things. When the more shards we have, the the less predictable it is actually uh, what other things will come from other shards, and so like even if you see a transaction coming. And you try to front run it. First of all, like uh, there are probably some other stuff from other shards will come in, may come in before you. So a as network grows, it actually becomes like more and more like interconnected and, and hard and predictable. Yeah, yeah, unpredictable to do things like front running. Really? I mean, more complex maybe, right? But seems like very possible. Yeah, yeah. This is this is not a solution. The, yeah, the, the, this is just a. It, it, it's like it makes it harder. Yeah, it makes it harder, and because like blocks are one second, it's like you need to observe the whole network at all times, pretty much, and be probably a validator of a large, like a large percentage of stake. That's probably the only way to be like, if effectively effective at front running. Mm -hmm. Everybody else are not able to do that, pretty much. Like, that that's kind of the point. I mean, like you can still you know do backruns, and that's what. You know all the arbitrage bots are doing, but if we're talking about actual front running, like plugging in in front of your transaction, you need to be uh, kind of a validator, and you need to be like in all the shards, ideally, to to be able to observe it. So, I mean, we have four shards now. I mean, what, what's the limit here? Like, how how far? Like, what are kind of the scalability limits to this? Right. So. So this takes us uh, to this land of security assumptions, right? Uh, when you design sharding, uh, what happens is that naturally, because every validator only validates a subset of shards, then every shard gets fewer validators than, than the security of the whole system, right? Uh, and, and so here you can make one of the two security assumptions. Security assumption number one says, hey, if I get a very large set of validators, like let's say uh, 10,000, uh, and I sample from them randomly a thousand of validators. Then you can say, hey, if the original set had, let's say, no more than 30% of bad guys, then you can do some math and you can deduce that the sample will also have like no more than 40% with the probability one minus one over, you know, quadrillion, quadrillion, something like that. All right, so then you say, well, if, if I assume for my BFT consensus already that the whole set has no more than 30%, I can I can assume that the sample will be safe, right? And so there are many sharded systems which are live today which rely on this assumption. Uh, the problem, so if we were relying on this assumption, there would be nothing uh, blocking us today from from going to significantly more shards. Uh, however, this assumption has a problem, which is you don't need to be bad guy in advance. You can become a bad guy after you were assigned to a shard, right? So the idea here being that most of the uh, validators they're not honest people; they're reasonable people. They're optimizing for the upside. Right? And so if you do need to corrupt the shard, if you do need to do something bad in the shard, then you will wait until the validators are assigned, and then you will go, you will identify them. There are fewer of them than the whole set, and you will corrupt them retroactively. Like you will bribe them or something. Hack into their machines. Yeah. yeah. Well, if you can hack, in, you can probably hack into everybody. But <laughs> I mean, I guess you could, I don't know if you could have some, I mean, I guess the only way I could imagine some kind of scenario like that being plausible, right? Might be if you're if you if you basically do it via smart contract, right? So that you could do put up like a bounty. Yes. Because like identifying, contacting, hacking into. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Like I think two years ago, I wrote exactly a blog post which just describes like how the smart contract would look. The problem <laughs> here is that in practice, those blog producers they not like like they sit in the same groups, you know, they they in the same Telegram groups. Where they discuss like the problems they're facing or, or, or like the hardware requirements, etc. So it's very easy to find them, right? So frequently it's it's also very easy to like find the mapping between people and, and pools. Also because pools, many pools validate multiple networks 
you also kind of know them from others. So it's, it's easy to find them. It's definitely possible to, like, it doesn't have to be very possible to corrupt them. It's enough for it to be generally plausible for you not to want to build a blockchain which can be broken this way, right? Uh, there are many things which look impractical, but uh, like when enough money is involved, uh, they become doable, right? So this concept is called adaptive corruption when you corrupt someone uh, after the fact. And uh, there are multiple protocols. So the one I know uh, is Polka.us and Ethereum 2 with their uh, designs. Uh, that are designed with an assumption that a shard can be adaptively, adaptively corrupted. So like a very large percentage, up to 100%. Uh, of all the validator nodes can be corrupted. And then usually the assumption is that there's at least someone in the network who validates the shard who is not corrupted, right? So if you read the nitrate paper that we have for near, we even try to build it, with, like we have some ideas how to address the situation where nobody voluntarily validates every shard. But, but that, is, that becomes like pretty unreasonable. You usually expect that in the entire network there's at least someone who is validating the shard. Like if nobody else, the exchanges do. Right. Yeah, indexers, exchanges. Indexers, yes. Uh, RPC tools, nodes. Yeah. So, so then you need, uh, what you do usually is you say, you do what optimistic rollups do. You say, hey, uh, if something happened, like, like if, you, if you track a shard and you see that the validators did something stupid, go and show it to us. So the entire system is built in such a way that any misbehavior can be proven cryptographically with a relatively small, small proof. And so if anyone observes something wrong, they can immediately send the proof to the network. The network will receive it, punish people who are to be punished, roll back, right? And so here the idea is that if you track all the shards, you will know in advance something bad is happening. You shut down your operation, right? So like if you're a hypothetical exchange, you will track all the shards, right? You have resources for that. Uh, you don't need to rely on challenges because you know that something went wrong. You're actually probably going to be the entity sending the challenge. Uh, if you do not have capacity to track all the shards, which majority of people will not, you only track a subset, but also your the way you interact with the network changes, right? If you if you have a transaction which which transfers a lot of value, right, for which it is absolutely crucial for you that it is not rolled back, then you wait. You wait a little more uh, to make sure the challenges are not coming in. For small transactions, you don't care. Like probably nobody will be rolling back the network because you bought like a five dollar NFT. Um, so that is the simple part. The hard part is that for you to send the challenge, you actually need to see the block. Like if, I, if, if the shard was corrupted and they did something stupid, uh, because the shard was corrupted, they, they uh, like a very simple way to think about it is because we built sharded system with the understanding that nobody can download all the blocks, uh, or at least majority of people cannot. Right, so that means that you should be able to validate or, or like operate the network, op like interact with other shards by not seeing the full blocks, the full chunks in our case of that shard. Right, so you you like you acting like many many parts of the system act as light clients. We right? only see the headers and the signatures of the block producers, and they act upon it. Right, so now if if we are bad guys and we want to do something bad, we will send enough information to everybody for them to act on our bad behavior, but we will not release more than that. We will not release the full block or the full chunk. And so the, even though there is someone who is tracking the shard, they will not be able to download this data because we no, ne never published it in order to challenge us. So that is one of the hardest problems in designing both uh, sharded system and rollups. Right? Like if you read uh, research on rollups, you will see that data availability is always the, bigger prob the biggest problem they're trying to solve. And the limitations they have today, like why optimism or arbitrum run 200 or how many they run transactions per second, is not because of the execution or storage or network, it's because of data availability, right? Uh, and so one of the biggest bottlenecks and the biggest and the biggest components of NEAR is the data availability subcomponent. Uh, and uh, so that's one of the biggest bottlenecks we, we're solving uh, to extend to more shards, but, but also uh, challenges. Uh, they are not, challenges are not in the production state yet. So the network that operates today does not have challenges enabled. And so because of that, validator nodes actually do track all the shards. It's called phase zero of Nightshade. Uh, so that's the second bottleneck, right? So before we, before we scale, so we can probably go to more than four, we can probably go to eight, maybe even more with this mode. But to scale to more, like to scale to 100 shards, we will need obviously both. We will need challenges enabled. Uh, but challenges are the easier part. Data availability is the harder, data availability is there. Data availability was the first thing we've built. Yeah, I would say that the, one of the issues with challenges is that because they don't actually happen in real life, right? So 
like normally, you know, if you're running a testnet, you, you're testing all the behaviors, you know, you're executing transactions, you're running blocks, you're distributing data availability. And so you, you know, you find all the issues right away. And with challenges, we actually had them. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but yeah, it never happened. There's an implementation. Yeah, and so and so like they're not tested very well. And so we actually need to create you know an adversarial environments where people are maliciously like corrupting network to test all that properly. And so you know, g given there is an exploding ecosystem, there's a kind of a bunch of other things we are working on uh, to solve for actually developers and users before um, kind of switching back to to finalizing challenges and having that more like a probably another incentivized network where people are incentivized to actually be slashed. <laughs> We're also probably nowhere close to the to the capacity today, right? So so you need to solve problem uh, problems as they come. We we are very like we are very much facing a problem today that for people it's very hard to interact with blockchains, right? Uh, uh, so so there's way more resources we're spending on the uh, on usability and DevEx uh, capacity. It's very clear how to how to scale, but we we know we're close to hitting it yet. Yeah, yeah. I think we did the resharding. So the kind of part of this whole point that, that developers and users don't need to think about the shards is that we can change number of shards, as I said, with governance. And so we did uh, kind of late last year in November change from one shard, which we've been running from launch to four shards. Um, and that was, you know, actually just like, I mean, there was a resharding mechanism that was happening for half a day underneath, right? But there was zero changes to users or developers, like how things interacting, no tooling needed to be changed, no, not nothing. Actually, zero downtime. Yeah, zero downtime that was there. And so kind of the idea is like to continue doing that pretty much ahead of any, you know, capacity growth that at least right now with governance, we can continue adding more shards uh, while also like adding some of the, you know, obviously testing more for the for the important pieces and uh, and launching them. And so that that's kind of been, you know, like a, a big piece of our philosophy, right, is being pragmatic and also continue, you know, continue innovating, continue iterating uh, to to enable those things kind of ahead of what users and developers want and need. Well, let's talk a bit about uh, maybe usability and developer experience. I remember that was always one of, uh, one of the things from the start that you were emphasizing a lot. I also remember you guys had this plan. I don't know if you ended up doing it, but to like focus on like high school students to get them like sort of get them early and get them onto near. Well, we have actually I have this photo from my high school, and uh, when I asked who 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 has near, not just familiar with near, who has near, it was like out of I don't know 40, 40 kids, I think like thirty five. Um, so <laughs> there's a bit of bias. Here. There's a bit of yeah. There's a bit of bias because it's my school. How, how did how did that happen? We run competitions. We run competition like programming competitions, and so we sponsor that from near um, and and pretty much prizes are near for for the kids. But, yeah. but the program competition is not near specific, right? It's yeah, like, it's I like generic. Yeah, it's yeah, like generic. forces. Yeah, I mean, this is like the thing we've been training with. Uh, we kind of running those comp like sponsoring those competitions um, across well. Mostly Ukraine right now, but uh, we we did sponsor the biggest one in the uh, at the end of the year on Code Forces. There was like fifty thousand people there. Yeah, yeah. So so we we definitely kind of working that maybe maybe not as as uh, globally as yet, um, but we actually have a lot of global global initiatives around the world, um, kind of targeting both like stu students and and uh, professionals. Usability, usability, yeah. yes. <laughs> yeah, usability. Yeah. So, what are yeah? What do you think are the most important, you know, things that other blockchains do wrong, and you know, what are the most important differences of near in terms of usability? Uh, so there are there are several things which we've done uh, from very very early on, from like the very first versions of near uh, that. Like effectively, it, it's very easy to find the problems. You you just observe people interacting with the blockchain, and you see the problems right away, <laughs> right? Uh, and so there's a couple of things that we've done from the very early on, which are different. So one of the biggest ones is the account model. Uh, on on most of the blockchains today, your account is your public key. It has multiple problems. One of them is that it's it's very cryptic, right? You come to a person, 
outside of crypto and say, hey, this is a, your account, this looks scary. The second problem is that your account is attached to your private key. Like that is a problem, right? If your private key is compromised, well, your account is gone, right? And at the very best, you can what you can do now is you can transfer assets while you still have access to it, right? But well, it, it assumes that assets are transferable, right? Which is not the case in many cases. It also assumes that you don't have some other value in your, in your account. Uh, so in near account and, and the keys are completely separate. So your account, it, it's a name. It's like alex.near. That's my account, right? Uh, and uh, uh, the, the account can have as many keys as you want. And those keys have different permissions, right? So you can have a full access key, uh, a full access key which, is, which means this key can do whatever to the account, right? You can, you can add new keys, you can delete keys, you can invoke any contract, transfer any money, right? Or you can have an uh, access key which says, hey, this access key can only interact with a particular contract, with a particular endpoint of the contract and has this spending allowance, right? And so now, if you have an account, like if I have my account, my, pri my, pri my, 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 my private key with the full access, I, I, I have like somewhere in custody uh, long hidden, right? But now if I want to, Let's consider this uh, sort of use case where you have an account that has a lot of money. Uh, it also participates in some DAOs, and also occasionally you play some NFT games or whatnot, right? So now, for the full access, you want it to be deep in the bunker in uh, uh, in Nebraska, uh, which nobody knows where it is, right? But now, if I want to, if I want to go and vote in the DAO, I don't want every time to. Well, go... now, now they know it's in Nebraska. <laughs> Well, maybe, maybe I changed the state. Anyway, <laughs> uh, uh, you don't want to go to Nebraska every time you want to vote on the DAO, right? So you want the key to... So, so now you can have another key specifically with the permission to the DAO, but also you do not want to treat that key lightly, right? Like, like participation in the DAO is a responsible thing. So that key, well, that key I will store in the ledger. So it is a ledger device next to me. I don't trust ledger, let's say, for, my, for full money, right? I don't want someone to come to my place with like a wrench. Uh, and uh, and get my password to the ledger, but I, but I'm okay trusting ledger uh, with participation in DAO. Now, if I'm playing a game, I don't want to use like ledger to sign every transaction, every action. So then I have another key, which is hey, uh, this key has access to the game. The key is stored in the local storage of the browser. So with the game, I interact as if it was a Web two game, right? G given that on, on on near the block time is two seconds, right? It's not real time. It's not Counter Strike. But but for for a very wide variety of games, two seconds latency is very acceptable. So now, if your private key is in the local storage of the browser, uh, then uh, it, it's extremely playable. It's extremely usable, right? Uh, all the while, you still have the same account. So on Ethereum, you would, or like on many other blockchains, you will literally have to have multiple accounts, right? So for the game, maybe that's acceptable. Maybe I don't care which account to play the game from. But but for the DAO, if it's not my main account now, there's some social protocol where I need to say, hey guys. You know this is you know this account is me, but I don't want to use it for the DAO. So hey, trust me that this account is me. I posted it on Twitter, right? Well, usually it's on like Telegram. It, it cannot go wrong. Right? <laughs> it's a it's a private chat on Telegram where you send another key to people, yeah. and then you also need to deposit more like money to pay fees on that account. So and yeah, yeah. And <laughs> yeah so 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 this account model is uh, is nice. It it also has this very nice property on top of that, which is when you onboard new people, right? So you want to bring a person to the ecosystem. You don't want them to understand what Ledger is. You don't want them to understand the sort of the hygiene of, of properly maintaining private keys. It's a pretty complex topic. So what you can do instead is instead you can have a centralized gate which stores the private key in its own database, right? Uh, which can walk away and like pull the rug at any moment. But you use the centralized gate to onboard people to interact with like small transactions. You say, hey, come to near. Buy the NFTs here, like like you know, play with this ecosystem projects with like a small amount of money just to, to get the feel of it. The key could be in the centralized store database of a centralized gateway, which is extremely usable. Now you play with near and eventually you buy an NFT, NFT goes in price. Now you have ten thousand dollar NFT on your account. You kind of don't want to trust that gateway anymore. Well, nothing can be easier. You just trust them one last time to change your key to the key you have on ledger. Now you actually have an incentive to understand how how to properly. Uh, organize your private keys, where to store them, how not to lose them, right? Because you have this NFT that you don't want to lose, right? And so you swap the key, it's the same account you've been using all this time, but now it has full security, right? So uh, it's it's very hard to do with any different account model. And it's easy to turn kind of your account into a multi-sig because you just add multiple keys that then are required to sign on something, to 
for example, perform an operation or set set of operations, you can you know create like a dead end switch on top of this account again, not changing anything to say. So like it's pretty much it's experience that you can build on top, right? That kind of is very mobile and, and allows you to kind of continue programming on. And so developers then can build new experiences. So one of the coolest things we've had from like from pretty early on is that you can send somebody a link and that link actually contains a private key. And so that private key is just to sign one transaction ever that will create account and move money to your account, right? So there's a contract on near that hosts kind of tons of public keys to which if you have a private key, you can send one transaction and then it will look up how much money that public key like was deposited and give you this money and delete that public key from being active again. And so by doing this, like it's called link drop, right? You can actually onboard people and we've been doing this as QR codes and there's links and there's everything. You can just send people, you know, money, NFTs, whatever. Like you can send them in DAO participation. Like you can send them like a link that, that is a private key that signs one transaction that is join this DAO, right? And so now they create an account, they have a little bit of money, you know, for fees, and then they're a member of a DAO from that, right? So you can program whatever complex, you know, experience you want, uh, kind of, and you, and this is just like sending them a link via, you know, text message or, or Telegram. Uh, and obviously you can scale that up then, and like how do you bring a bunch of users through that as well. You can also sell pre, pre, pre-configured accounts yeah, there, there's a, there's a marketplace on here where you can sell accounts. Like like your account has uh, some a collection of NFTs, uh, which is unique, and you sell it. Well, even more interesting, you you can be the author of a bunch of NFTs that you sold, but you're receiving royalties. So one of the things that Near has is more kind of sophisticated NFT standard because it was designed by all the NFT marketplaces on Near, and so they embedded royalties into the standard, uh, which means that like as I create a bunch of NFTs, I sell them, this NFTs have encoded that I'm the author and I receive a small fee uh, when they get resold through all the marketplaces. And by I, I mean this account. And so this account becomes in a way a business that has a revenue stream from future sales of these NFTs. And you can sell this business or turn it into a DAO pretty much from, from that spot, right? And again, this is like, in Ethereum, you would need to like create a bunch of accounts, you know, deploy contracts, do all this stuff ahead of time. And if you already done this, you will not be able to change that. Like on Near, this allows you to kind of really easily kind of, you know, turn it into a DAO, issue a token. You know, now people can receive this revenue stream from this token, for example. Or you can go and sell it as a bus- like as a quote unquote business on one of the account marketplaces. Right, right. I mean, a, a lot of from what you were describing actually sounds a lot like, you know, something that Gnosis Safe does on on Ethereum, right? It's basically this like smart contract wallet that you know. But of course, here the nice thing being that it, it being a, like you know natively like a native thing, right? And and including integrated, I guess, with something. That's a lot like ENS, right? And you're okay, Alex not near, and, and with just I guess a lot less friction than you have with with something like Gnosis. Yeah, we looked at real use cases, and we looked at kind of you know things like the ACL, like normal account management in you know in Web two, and then kind of brought it all together into one model that then people can build on top. Yeah, we we have uh, we we have couple applications today on near which are not targeting crypto audience. They are targeting normal people, well, non crypto, I guess. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, and uh, very infrequently do we see people complaining about something going wrong, right? So so we have uh, we have like a mechanical Turk, if you know what it is. So that's what it started with, right? Ilya and I wanted to label data. We couldn't. We built near. So 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 there is a labeling platform now on near. Right, so the actual use case was solved, uh, and people who work on labeling platforms—that's people from from all over the world who need money, right? Uh, and uh, they they come and work, but they're not crypto native, and and usually they generally not very non tech savvy, right? They do not like like for many of them like Instagram and internet are synonyms, right? Yeah, it's uh, like factory workers, uh, people who work in the service industry, or people who just do not work because of pandemic, right? Uh, so, so they come and work on this portal, and uh, 
very rarely do we see in the support channels people complaining that something goes wrong. People do lose accounts still, right? So uh, uh, the hygiene of maintaining private keys is still a little complex, but that that that, that like we solve through education and through, and through better tooling, right? So, so so we improve. The thing is that our our infrastructure allows to improve on that, right? But they but they do understand how to create an account. They don't understand how to use it to interact with an application, right? They don't understand how to ultimately move money out uh, and uh, cash them to to do whatever they need on a daily life. And they right? even sell accounts. And and they yes, they do sell accounts. So the idea was that the, the portal was launched. Eventually, the uh, the the amount of, of it became extremely popular because people do want to earn money. Uh, and so, unfortunately, the demand, use case. Uh, the demand, what would be supply, what would be demand here? I guess supply is workers, right? Yeah. No, demand is workers. Anyway, there, there, there was way more workers than work, right? And so the portal shut down the uh, the invites. And so now any account that has an invite is suddenly a very, very uh, valuable thing. And so those accounts are being sold constantly for, for quite a bit of money, right? And uh, if accounts were not so, so sellable, well, then you would have a dead weight if you cannot work anymore. <laughs> yeah. How how do you have privacy, right? So uh, you have like, okay, Alex on near, and then I mean, I, I guess all of the addresses or accounts associated with that, of course, would be like linked and visible. Or like, would you would you imagine that people then have some sort of anonymous dot near? I don't know, and and then they keep like Alex dot near, and and you have like I don't know, dark Alex dot near, <laughs> or like how. Yeah. You, you don't even have to have a .near account. You can have an account which is a public key. Th though, ironically, the public key account is still like a full-fledged near account, so you can change the private key later. <laughs> so it's still going to be a public key, key, key account, but it will have nothing to do with the corresponding private key. All right, but you, you can have any obscure name if you want to. Uh, answering the second part of the question, which, which is implied, I guess, uh, there are, I don't know if anyone is live, but, but there are multiple teams working on uh, like tornadoes, caches of the world. Uh, yeah. Generally, like blockchain right now is a, it's not a privacy engine; it's a transparency engine, right? And so, in a way, like it, it creates transparency, and that's how we have you know DAOs and kind of uh, consensus. And but at the same time, there needs to be privacy, and so privacy is built kind of on top. And so, yeah, the 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 goal for sure is to be able to have like a kind of private transactions, even if they're executed as smart contracts. And that's the whole point that you can run. You know, another chain worth of worth of logic as a smart contract on here um, that your account interacts with, and so yes, you know, Tornado Cash, Zcash style uh, things can run on near kind of as a smart contract, allowing you to uh, transact privately as well. And and the interesting thing again is that so Aurora is kind of doing that right now, and so they they tweaked it a little bit, but they for a for a long time they were running with zero fees. Right, so they've actually uh, hit the fee for paying for the blockchain from the user, uh, and then covered the kind of the fee that blockchain requires, like a near themselves, and then kind of created a, an economic model around that. And the kind of the logic there, among other things, were first of all, it's way more usable if you do that, and you can actually charge, you know, flat fee like five dollars, for example, for a service, or like you can do all kinds of things on top. And like with specifically this this gateway, right? You, you don't even trust in it because you're actually signing with your key, and the gateway just propagates and pays the fees. And so when we're talking about privacy, kind of the the goal will be to also have similar model where you're not actually propagating a transaction uh, directly from from uh, your account. You start propagating it through some of the three layers, and you just kind of pay some subscription fee to them, such that now you're able to transact in this like privacy pools without revealing who you are and then still be able to like visibly vote on DAOs and maybe, you know, buy your NFTs and showcase them to everyone. Okay. As long as you have the, the primitives for uh, BLS signatures, none of that needs to be on the protocol level, right? So any, any of those systems uh, which rely on uh, zero knowledge proofs or, or any similar technologies, they can just be built as a contract. Cool. Well, let's talk a little bit about maybe like the ecosystem and you know what's going on in the near, uh, yeah, the near world. What one thing uh, was mentioned? I think one of your team was also like sent a reference to that. Is this thing called Pagoda? 
uh, I don't know, Ilya, can you can you talk about that? What's what is Pagoda? For sure, yeah. So kind of the I would say again, starting a little bit from philosophy, right? So I worked at Google, and Google is a very kind of interesting place when you get in because inside they kind of build this like open source culture where you know all the source code for all the products is you know open in one repository. Uh, you have all the services that you can latch on and hook in. I mean, with some PII, etc. Uh, permissions, obviously, and you can also contribute and maybe even participate in other projects. And you can start your own project. But it's a permission model at the end, and and importantly, it also doesn't have internal kind of way to decide which projects are more valuable than others, right? Um, it's pretty much like some VP deciding at the end if you know we should shut down this project or start a new one. And so, kind of the philosophically, what we're trying to build with this new ecosystem is a, I call it open Google, right? It's this idea that uh, you have a common platform, right, which everybody builds on, latches on, um, that is decentralized. And then everybody can have a kind of their own project team, you know, uh, thing which work together. They still, you know, they still are kind of in one ecosystem that is collaborating and working together. But they all have their independent kind of economic models, right? And so Aurora is a great example because it was actually, you know, part of our team uh, that was working with us that uh, came out as a separate entity, as a separate organization. Uh, they had their own fundraise, they launched their own token, they kind of operating and growing right now themselves. And that on its own, on its own creates like a huge, you know, scale because Aurora itself is actually like, you know, a huge ecosystem now uh, that has, you know, whatever, like probably like few projects launching every week now, like, you know, Gnosis launched and Acer Scan launched and all kind of stuff. And so similarly, we have few other projects of, you know, similar scale, like Octopus is obviously another one which has a big ecosystem itself as kind of independent team. Uh, we have a Makina, which is like a storage project. We have a Calimera, which is a more enterprise private chart uh, as well. And so, kind of as this has been happening, um, like all of these projects still exist and work on the same core, right? On the same protocol, kind of either by using it, by building to it, to, by contributing to it, by, you know, pulling people to add more stuff. Um, and so that, that's kind of the idea that like uh, the ecosystem is continuing, you know, growing, there's more participants, everybody's contributing. And so for, for people who are familiar with open source, this is very similar to something Linux, where you have a Linux project, which is uh, kind of the kernel and a lot of like tooling around it, which is an open source project that kind of runs independently of any company or foundation, right? It exists, it existed, and probably going to continue to exist. And there's Linux Foundation, which is designed to kind of propagate and, you know, protect the brand and, and you know, pull people and create marketing and do all the stuff. And then there's companies like Red Hat, Canonical, you know, Linux, like uh, Intel and Google and Microsoft, who all have teams working on these protocols. But then they have business around it that they offer uh, kind of to their clients, right? Or, or they run it, like Azure runs, you know, tons of Linux, so they want to contribute to it. So similarly, you know, we have all these teams now who are, who are doing this. And so our original company, right, the company that it all started with, uh, in a way, it's transforming, right? It's transforming into this new thing, which is Pagoda. Uh, and Pagoda is a Web3 startup platform. It's a place where you can come in and you get all the tooling you need to develop your startup, right? This is, you know, all the RPC data, all the indexing, all the, uh, you know, with like token launch toolkits and, you know, you have wallet, wallet kind of APIs and all the stuff. And it's, this is the biggest contributor to all the open source, like of near protocol of SDKs of APIs, which is all the open source projects, but there are other contributors as well. And so, Kind of this creates like an alignment because there's a business model and there's kind of a clear, uh, you know, desire to improve for the customers that are using this platform while still continue contributing to this kind of open source project that everybody runs. And then on parallel, I mean, I would say like on the flip side, you have a ton of stuff that specifically designed to, to do go to market, right? And so foundation is, is in a way this, you know, I would say like a kind of initial booster of the ecosystem, but it's, you know, it's actually not about foundation. It's about now things like Proximity Labs, which is helping all, a lot of DeFi projects to be successful, to kind of launch, to um, to build. There's things like Human Guild, which works with, I think like 100 
founders, but like 30 games building there, like tons of like NFT marketplaces, NFT projects, like ton of people who are kind of, they have a huge community. We have things like uh, MetaVab, which is Ecofund. We have things uh, kind of in near U- in Ukraine, which is Binary Star, that are, you know, hosting and developing a bunch of projects. So in a way, it's kind of, you know, ever expanding ecosystem with a lot of participants who are working together, who are coordinating, uh, and at the same time, having their own kind of incentives and, and uh, business models around that. And there's a diagram somewhere that make it, we can probably link kind of uh, in a pretty way, <laughs> putting it all together. Yeah. yeah Nearing needed to exist for us to launch, but now it's just one, one of the many participants. And so they're for rebranding. So for you, for you guys, what are the biggest, you know, the biggest things that you feel like, okay, you know, these are, you know, some really hard problems or like the biggest challenges that are still ahead? Yeah, so I mentioned kind of the security, uh, simplicity, security and scalability, and we made pretty good progress in simplicity and, and scalability, but security is still a big uh, concern for everyone in blockchain. And, and if we want to get to a billion users, which is our kind of nearest you know, outstanding, like big hairy goal is we need to solve that. And so kind of one of the, one of the efforts that being there is uh, contract registry. So how do we keep track of, uh, you know, contracts, their source code, their audits and potentially security uh, advisories, right? Which are indicating that there's something wrong with this contract. Uh, and, and so people should be cautious, right? So this way, when you're in your wallet, right, transacting with this contract, it actually can surface this information directly and being able to provide you the kind of heads up if something is happening. We can also do active, you know, threat detection and prevention directly in wallets and kind of wallet services, pretty much realizing that, you know, some NPM packages were uh, maliciously attacked. Some, you know, some, some types of accounts and contracts are being compromised, right? You, you're transacting with someone, like things like AML even uh, can be done within, within this framework. And beyond that, you know, we're talking about, you know, seed phrases. Seed phrases are really easy to lose. And, and this is like already in Web2, you know, we have passwords and, you know, passwords been leaking all the time. And obviously like this, you know, its own set of problems, why is this happening? But Web2 built a lot of tooling to figure out how to detect when this is not you actually going into it, right? And so we can actually build, I call it active custody, where... Uh, there's someone else who is analyzing if this, like you sign this transaction, right? And it analyzes if this is you sign the transaction, if there is some, again, NPM packages, you know, getting hacked, seed phrases getting, you know, stolen, like, can we detect that? Can we analyze that you're signing, you know, halfway around the world? Uh, can we detect that this is a very suspicious type of transaction and then have a co-signer that, that analyzes that and decides if they want to sign or not? And co-signers can be, you know, your friends, for example, kind of, you know, your friend's computer, maybe a bank or some kind of other custodian or potentially validators themselves on the network, right? Who are already actually securing the network. And so this kind of like expanding really beyond, you know, seed phrase is like the only way that people, like if somebody gets your seed phrase, I mean, obviously we've done, done some of it with just uh, kind of permission control, but even beyond that, how do we, uh, how do we create more uh, security on, around that? I think beyond that is education. So the, I think biggest problem is still people do not know the, like how this stuff works and they're scared. They're scared because, because of security partially and like they see, you know, rug pulls and money stolen and broken and all those things. Like developers are scared to launch stuff. Developers are scared to build things and go into blockchain as well. And users are scared to use this because they don't fully understand what's going on. And like on one side, we should make it easier so they don't need to understand. But on the other side, we need to educate, we need to bring more people in. And so we've been running near university, but really kind of scaling that up, right? So right now we, you know, thought like 5,000 people, but, you know, how do we go to a million people from there, uh, kind of across the world, um, kind of educating and bringing people up into, into this ecosystem? Well, um, thanks so much, guys. It's been really great to, you know, hear about near hear about like the progress it's also been great for from like sort of us with course one to be able to like you know run nodes participate in in the progress of the network 
And yeah, I think it's really, really exciting. I think you've come a long way and I'm super excited to see, you know, what, what the next years and decades hold for near and, and to see whether we can make it to the, you know, 1 billion users and beyond. Exactly. Just the beginning. Well, thanks so much. And thanks so much for listeners as well. And we'll see you next week.